Everybody, welcome to Revved Up for Sunday. We are the clergy of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut, and I'm Peter Walsh. I'm Elizabeth Garnsey. And I'm Justin Crisp. The three of us love getting together once a week to take a look at the gospel for this coming Sunday. And we know that you have a lot of choices out in the world of pod and that you've clicked on us, and we're grateful for that. One of the things that we sometimes think about is, you know, how can we take the jargon and make it simple in a way that we can all understand. So just to start with jargon, what we've got here today is an epiphany that comes from a theophany that only one person sees, who then bears witness and gives us a Christology. Let's go to the reading. This is John 1, 29 to 42. John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here he is, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Mm. Mm. There is so much in this gospel. I, oh I, I, I mean, it's such a fantastic passage, and it really is great for Epiphany. It doesn't kick off the season of Epiphany, but it sure is a highlight. And I'm, I'm always picture like a staged play, you know, at this mm. first section where John is saying, look, here is the Lamb of God. And then, you know, at the end of his scene, he might, you know, fade out into the black and then Jesus emerges into the front, you know, the forerunner. Mm. I mean, the front, you know, the front man, Jesus is the, is the prominent character in this story. And John, you know, finally hands over the baton. And mm. I just love the, the cinemagraphic way that John writes. And there's just so many layered meanings. There's never just one one meaning here and you know imagery of a dove imagery of the lamb of god imagery of even just where is jesus staying as if he's got an address but it's so so much a spiritual question um so you know just to set the stage of, of our conversation i i just feel like um we could you could preach about 50 sermons off of this passage and <laughs> take any one of these things so so it's rich and i i love the kind of um, y you know, it's, it's one of these passages you really could spend your whole life studying and, and not miss anything in the gospel. You know, yeah. it's, it's sort of got it all. And, um, I especially wanted to name Andrew, maybe mm. just as a kind of, yeah, um, nice. prologue that, that this is the scripture for Andrew's feast day mm -hmm. in November. And he, you know, Andrew's the brother of Peter. I mean, who wants to be the brother of Peter? It, it, so talk about living in the shadows, <laughs> you know. But he, but Andrew, throughout the scripture, is always the one that's like, "Come on, I've I found the one," and he's the one who brings Peter to Jesus. 
Later, he, he brings the two Greeks to Je- who want to see Jesus. Mm-hmm. And Andrew's also the one who, um, you know, when the little boy has loaves and fishes, it's Andrew who brings him to Jesus. You know, so he's got like relatives, friends, strangers, bringing them all yeah. into Jesus. And, um, you know, that's his great, great gift. And um, Sam Pataro talks about this with Andrew, mm. that, that he that Andrew is the, um, he's, he's one who does this kind of gift giving where he, he honor, it's the highest honor you can pay to someone to think that they're fit to present to God mm. as a gift. And so, you know, Andrew has this discipleship that honors the, really the dignity of every person. And he says, oh, come, you know, I need to give you to God so God can be given to you. And uh, I've always loved that you know, this idea that you are worthy as to be presented to God. Wow. And that to me is the Andrew, that's kind of the, the character of Andrew for yeah. me. Yeah. That, that sometimes get buried in this because, yeah. because sometimes we would miss Andrew because he's sort of a shadow character, right? but right. he really yeah. plays a big role. I love Andrew yeah. because I'm Scottish. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, of course. You know, not yeah. by, not by, um, I'm not a Scottish citizen or anything like that. Oh my gosh, that would be so cool. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, uh, Andrew and uh, there, anyway, lots of traditions about Andrew in Scotland, mm-hmm. but I, I, I have always liked Andrew for exactly this reason. He's always bringing people to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I grew up in a tradition where, um, there was a lot of talk about, um, about, taking the gospel to other people, right? Proclaiming the good news and so on. Um, and I think that Andrew is the truest kind of evangelist because what Andrew is doing, he is not so much that he is like giving people new information. Mm-hmm. He's bringing them to Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's what he's doing. He's mm-hmm. bringing them as an offering. He's bringing them um, for their healing. Uh, you know, Andrew is both an icon of um, an icon for me of what it means for me to be a priest. I don't think that I'm the one doing the healing, right? All that I'm ever doing is I'm just bringing people to Jesus so that Jesus can change their lives. Um, but also, he is an icon of the priesthood of all believers, He's mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. Uh, what we're all called to do, because we're all called to bring people to Jesus. We don't mm-hmm. have to be Jesus. Uh, it's enough for Jesus to be Jesus. All we have to do is do Andrew mm-hmm. and do as Andrew did with, does with Simon here and just, just right. uh, bring, our, bring, bring our siblings to, uh, <laughs> to, to our Lord. Um, so I, I love Andrew. There is so much other stuff going on in this passage. I might just mm-hmm. pick out one thing here, which is the lamb imagery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister is a large animal vet, and uh, she has a thing for sheep. Uh, I think if there was serious money, if there was like a career trajectory in sheep for large animal vets, that would be what my sister was doing. Uh, she really <laughs> loved um, <laughs> taking classes on ruminants uh, uh-huh. in um, in vet school. Now, alas, she works on calf cattle ranches. I mean, she lives a pretty cool life uh, working mm-hmm. on ranches all of the time. She works with cattle because there's, there's an industry for cattle as opposed to sheep in the United States. But anyway, uh, my sister always loves these stories about lambs. And so I, lo- I, ca- I, I love these stories because they remind me of her. But the lamb imagery is incredibly rich here. Uh, you know, we get a, we've talked a lot on this podcast about Jesus being a shepherd, mm-hmm. um, especially when we were when we were discussing those great parables of love in the Gospel of Luke, uh, you know the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the the the, the good shepherd, the uh, the the lost sheep, the the shepherd who goes off to find the one and leaves the ninety nine behind, and so on. But here we have Jesus as the sheep itself, rather than the shepherd. And um, I was reading um, this book by Pope Benedict, uh, Joseph Ratzinger. Um, volume one of his Jesus of Nazareth trilogy, which I just say is a beautiful little book. I've had, um, I've had uh, Ratzinger on my mind because we are recording this podcast on the eve of his funeral in Rome. Um, in any way, and, uh, I know Ratzinger is a, a man um, about whom a great many people have a great many very strong opinions. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll just say that regardless of what your opinion of him is, um, I, my feeling about Ratzinger is he was a beautiful theologian. He wrote, and I learned a great deal about God and about Jesus from him and from these books in particular, this, this trilogy on Jesus um, that he wrote while he, was, while he was Pope. But he made clear this was, um, this was not a book he was trying to write you know, with, magi- with the authority of the magisterium or the teaching authority of the Pope. He was writing it just as Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, he says it's his personal search for the face of the Lord and the meditations that he has in this book are really beautiful. 
And his meditation on the lamb, as he begins to, um, on the lamb imagery here at the beginning of John, as he begins to peel away the different references, he says that Jesus is referred to by, um, all, uh, by many figures in the many authors in the New Testament as the Lamb. Uh, we've got uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. We've got the Gospel of John here, uh, of course, here in John chapter 1, but also in John 19. You've got 1 Peter chapter 1. You've got uh, Revelation chapter 5, where Jesus is the slain Lamb, the, the, the Lamb who appears as though he were slain. Um, this Lamb imagery in the New Testament is building on, he says, um, an identification of the suffering servant from the suffering servant songs of Isaiah with a sacrificial lamb. Um, in Isaiah chapter 53, it just talks about the suffering servant as being one who, like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb. Um, and the suffering servant songs seem to have been part of Jesus' own self-conception. This was one of the ways that Jesus was making sense of his own messianic identity. Um, and the imagery of the Lamb is embedded in those suffering servant songs. And the meaning of the Lamb and the suffering servant song, Ratzinger thinks, is a throwback to yet an earlier Old Testament text, namely the Passover Lamb from the book of Exodus. Um, so in that story, um, our listeners at home will recall, the last plague of the Egyptians called down from God by Moses to try to prompt Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of their bondage and their enslavement in Egypt is um, uh, the slaughter of the firstborn sons of Egypt. And in order to spare the households of Israel, um, what the people of Israel do is they take a lamb, they kill the lamb, and then they, they, they smear the blood of the lamb over the, the doorposts of their houses. And so then the, uh, the, the, the spirit which is going to take the lives of the firstborn sons of Egypt passes over those households. So that's where you get the Passover lamb. It's, and that is this plague which in the story of the Exodus finally makes Pharaoh go, okay, I give up, you can go. And so then the, the liberation of the people of Israel follows that. Um, and so here's Jesus as the lamb of the suffering servant song, who is also the, a kind of cosmic Passover lamb figure one through whose death and suffering, new life and freedom is going to come about. And all of this is embedded in the first chapter of John and in this tiny little sentence, look, here is the Lamb of God. John the Baptist somehow has the whole of Jesus's life and mission, the whole of his death and resurrection in that one phrase. Once you begin to peel back all of the layers of the onion, um, Ratzinger calls it a theology of the cross. He says John the Baptist has a theology of the cross here. Uh, once you begin to really, really plumb the depths of the biblical imagery. Yeah, wow, beautifully said by both of you. Uh, there's no doubt that I think one of the geniuses of John's gospel, and we would say in this case to John the Baptist too, this in this incredibly short <laughs> passage, this is what I was saying earlier, we get this incredible Christology. And one of the things that we've all noted since we started doing these podcasts is the more you know about the story, the better the story gets. And so, mm -hmm. so for instance, in, in just this little bit that we've got, you just gave us uh, an outline of the apocalyptic lamb, right, that we see in the book of Revelation where the lamb, the lamb slays evil. At the end of the book of Revelation, we get the suffering servant as a lamb, and then we get the paschal lamb all layered into mm -hmm. this, behold the lamb of God, right? And then, uh, and then we also get from John, we get, we get uh, Jesus as preexistent, and we mm -hmm. might want to spend another little mm -hmm. bit here on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who's the, who's the top dog, the one who came, mm -hmm. you know, he's ahead of me because he came before me, and this mm -hmm. is, I mean, this mm -hmm. is, this is, uh, this almost sounds like sibling rivalry here, right, you know, priority. <laughs> uh, so we get, uh, does John the Baptist have some sense of a preexistent Jesus, particularly when he says, I don't know who this guy is, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the, the third piece we get here is, is Jesus as a vehicle of the Spirit, when the Spirit descends upon Jesus, it mm -hmm. sticks. It's not like, mm -hmm. this is not a glancing blow, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, he, it comes into him. And, and so out of the testimony of John, we get that. And then we get the testimony of, 
of Andrew, who we just touched on, you know, this yeah. is Messiah. So in this short mm-hmm. little passage, which, uh, which when we decided we were going to make this podcast yesterday, we were like, oh yeah, just a few <laughs> sentences, <nothing> about it. <laughs> throwing us all into panic because oh. it turns out, as you were just pointing out, this is packed with, yeah. in some sense, the fullness of who is Christ. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and then the interesting portion for me is we get all of these titles, but when they ask like, uh, you know, Jesus, the invitation that, that it comes from Jesus, you're like, what are you, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? And he, mm-hmm. and he says, come and see that what Jesus invited them is experience before doctrine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this is a whole host of doctrine that comes before experience if mm-hmm. we hear this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I mean, John, so. as we know, is the latest written gospel, the most highly developed sense of Christo- Christology among the followers of Jesus at this time, you know, very late first century, if not into the second, right? Mm-hmm. And um, they have a whole developed community. And um, so it's the one where Jesus is the serene, you know, all-knowing, sort mm-hmm. of self-assured, I'm here for a mission and I know what it is, and, right. you know, uh, and yeah. all that. And so it's sort of st- high-style ideas here. But um, I, I love, I think the Lamb of God, you know, uh, I want to tie it back to um, the community's loss of their temple and mm-hmm. everything. And, mm. you know, of course, with John, it's long, long mm-hmm. gone by the time this community's gathering in wherever this writer is. And, um, you know, the, the question that the disciples ask, where are you staying? For this whole community of Israel, God dwelled in the temple. Mm-hmm. You know, God lived there and the lambs were the essential vehicle for creating order and meaning and connection and relationship to God and righteousness. You know, if they went to make their sacrifices in the temple, they could meet God there and God received that, that orderly ritual. And so the, you know, and then there's also this image of a sheep, which like the he goat kind of smelly um, scapegoat idea, Mm -hmm. which was also a sacrificial lamb. Um, to, to phrase it as the lamb of God, you know, it's much more the innocent, um, silent, suffering servant. But the community had this idea of a scapegoat, too, that would take away the sins of the people and be, you know, we would talk about this with preparation for baptism sometimes, that the people face west, you know, the place of nothingness and separation and darkness and where the scapegoat would be sent off into the horizon with the sins of the people, the high priest having, like, heaped the sins of the people on it and sent it away never to return um you know but Jesus, that that's spilling someone else's blood it's like the sacrifice was to spill the blood of the lamb as a substitute for mm. our own selves and so jesus you know to be the lamb of god like not only turns that around to be a, an image of self sacrifice it's also that he becomes the new temple you know, I mean, where are you staying? Throughout John, he's const- John, this writer is constantly using this word staying, abiding, meno, you know, the Greek word that repeats and repeats throughout John and then the letters of John. And the people don't have a temple to dwell in anymore. They don't, I'm, su- I'm sure they're like, where is God? You know, when we don't have a temple, how do we know God is here and where do we find God? And they have to be taught and, and formed in this notion that Jesus is the new dwelling place, you know, and the temple is a cultural institution, a temporal building of this earth, and was destroyed. And I think, you know, for the, for the Israelites, it was their culture. It was like temple culture. And, you know, when, when, we, when, when Jesus is, you know, where does Jesus dwell and stay? Where do we find the place of God? Um, where do the question can be turned around for us. Where are we staying? Where do we put our attention? Where do we put our assurance and our confidence? Is it in our cultural institutions? Is it in our church buildings and our traditions? You know, the way we've always done things. All these things can disappear and be ripped out from under us. And, you know, if we're staying there, it's going to be very unsettling and um, devastating. So I think for this community of John, when they're, they're living away from Jerusalem and no more temple, 
Jesus clearly emerges as the new dwelling place. And he says over and over again, I am in my father. My father abides in me, mm. abide in me. You know, he says it over right. and over. So they're asking him where he's staying. And eventually he's going to say, and where are you going to stay? You know, mm. so it's, it's a really, I think the lamb of God is the tip of that iceberg that he, he's all these things for John who writes in this way that's so layered and you can't really extract one image without all the other images as part of it. Um, so it's, it's fun to really tease out these meanings, plus it's so beautiful. And I think for the community, critical for their survival and their self-understanding. Yeah, I think you're totally right. Um, it's really, really compelling to me the way that you're putting you know, really the systematic theology of John on the table. Um, I had not connected where are you staying, this question, which you're interpreting a, it rightly as a penetrating spiritual question, not just a, uh, you know, a literal, mm. like, hey, dude, what's your address? <laughs> to tell you. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> are you at the Red Roof Inn or something like that? <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, it, it's riffing on this theme of abiding, which is one of John's overriding concerns in mm -hmm. the gospel and I I love those chapters towards the end of of John's gospel where he's talking about the the mutual indwelling that that he has with the one that he calls father um you know I am in the father the father is in me and then if you abide in me then we will abide in you uh mm -hmm. and then in the overarching um uh um narrative of the Johannine literature taken as a whole corpus. If you go to the book of Revelation, which is part of this Johannine body of work, then uh, there you have the ultimate vision of abiding where the heavenly Jerusalem descends and it says that the home of God is among mortals. And, uh, you know, you have, mm -hmm. where, where are you staying? The answer is here and everywhere mm, and mm -hmm. where are you staying where you're staying in me god has become a place and all of creation has become god's temple which is a kind of restoration mm -hmm. um i think in oh, yeah. the vision of revelation of the the temple garden of the of the the, the garden of eden in the book of genesis Mm -hmm. But anyway, so this is, uh, you, you've got that one little question here, which is almost a throwaway line. I mean, I, I wrote in the margins of my paper here that uh, the disciples evade Jesus's question, what are you looking for? Right. And then they say, well, where are you staying? And I'm like, yeah. well, they didn't answer his question. And just in that, you've unsurfaced by just scratching, scratching, scratching at it, this whole architecture, this whole spiritual architecture, which is in John's, John's thought. Mm -hmm. Um the, the other thing that I, might, um, that I might add here before we leave the lamb imagery is just how beautiful the line, um, who takes away the sins of the world, is. Okay. Uh, the universal character of that statement. And I think it's intentionally universal in John. And we talked a lot about the relationship between the particular and the universal and the fact that um, God is working through this particular people, Israel, their particular history, as it comes to some kind of culmination, this particular person, this particular human being, Jesus, to accomplish something which has import for all people and for all of creation. And here you have, again, you have the culmination of Israel's story in this lamb who takes away the sin of the whole world right here at the beginning of the Gospel of John. Um, and it is, um, I'll just say, um, there are some pretty esoteric debates in Reformed theology and the variety of Protestant theology about whether or not Jesus' atonement was limited or universal. Uh, these were things which, you know, used to really exercise and vex um, nerdy evangelical kids like me growing up in the <laughs> southeastern United States. Uh, is the atonement limited or universal? Um I just say this is one of the. I mean, but but the 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 implication is: um, Did Jesus die for everyone, or just for a few, just for the quote unquote elect, just for the select favorites of God, as it were? Um, not to unfairly lampoon the position, but also to lampoon the position just a little bit because I can't resist. Because this line is it just straight up contradicts it. It's universal. Jesus takes away the sins of the world. Period. I don't think John has any vision that this is just for a couple of people. For John, it's for all people. In fact, it's for the entire cosmos. It's for the entire created order, especially by the time you get to Revelation. Um, 
Yeah, beautiful. I even as a little boy. I mean, you you two have different lives than I do, obviously, but different. It's like we grew up on different like, planets. Different planets. <laughs> you just but, grew up in upstate New York. But uh, it's like Mars. Uh, yeah, this little Catholic church. But I do remember the priest saying, "O oh, Lamb of God, that take us to away, take us away mm-hmm. the sins of the world, have mm-hmm. mercy." And as a little boy, I, I was super tracking on that. I didn't know right. what it meant. But I did know what it meant, mm-hmm. right? On the one hand, I, d- I couldn't uh, enumerate all the all of the Lamb of God imagery mm-hmm. as taking away the sins of the world or defeating evil and what its what its Hebrew roots were. But it's a little boy there in the back pew with my basketball. I got the idea. I mean, I got the idea. Okay, uh-huh. this guy takes away the sins. You know, mm-hmm. got that. I think that um, you know, back to your upbringing, your upbringing, and in, in my back pew with my sister. Uh, on the way to confession afterward to Abe's Market to get some hot balls. Um, <laughs> that, uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that's, that's really interesting here is uh, how the disciples come to know who Jesus is and how it is that they mm-hmm. come to give their lives for yeah. him. Mm-hmm. And, and so in the first two chapters, I mean, the first chapter of John, we get this whole setup before we get in the second chapter of the wedding at Cain of Galilee and the first miracle where the things that they're hearing now, they begin, they don't believe until really the second chapter here in chapter 11, I think it says, I think it ends at chapter 11, it says, and they believed. Mm-hmm. But we get this, we, we, we get this calling of the disciples and right now we're in Bethany in Transjordan, right on the, on the other side of the Jordan River, other side from Jerusalem where John the Baptist has his community. This is the fourth time we've talked about John the Baptist mm-hmm. over the last eight weeks, right? We had two no. in Advent and now we're in our second I've never one. known so much about John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah, John the Baptist. Mm. And uh, <laughs> we, I, I, I'm, you know, I, at first I might have bristled at that, and now I'm really psyched. Yeah. I was reading that book on Holy Scriptures that um, the presiding bishop, Frank Griswold, worked with, um, with Mark on the, 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 the mystical theologian mm-hmm. and, and Frank was talking about befriending John and mm. knowing John as a friend. And I feel like we've mm. come a long way to know yeah. John as a friend mm-hmm. as, uh, as his, as his, you know, those, those, um, early paintings of John's finger, you were, you know, pointing yeah. toward Jesus uh, here. And, and now, we, right. And now we find mm. ourselves, we, we, you've already borne witness to Andrew pointing, uh, that way with his invitation and, and we get the calling of the disciples on the Jordan River and not the Sea of Galilee. And most of us grew up with uh, that Jesus showed up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he got off to a great start, right? <laughs> uh, he, he got James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were fishermen and, and seemingly business partners with Peter and his brother Andrew, and he got four mm-hmm. and said, follow me. And they got up and boogied. And I remember, well, I think that was one of our early podcasts. And you were like, how can this be? <laughs> this, this doesn't jive well in the Garnsey household that they just got up and left everything super irresponsible kind of thing. And, and so let me uh, just posit one thing and see what you all have to say. Mm-hmm. This is not original to me, but let me throw it out. And it, those people in Podville might find it interesting too. So one of the, one of the ways that we, we find ourselves with, with the scripture that disagrees with itself, and sometimes we seek to harmonize it, and sometimes there's no harmony to be had. Mm-hmm. So in this scripture, we have two that are problematic. One is that three times John says, I don't know this guy. I mm-hmm. didn't know this guy. Mm-hmm. And we've just done the Luke and infancy mm-hmm. narrative mm-hmm. where the visitation with Mary and Elizabeth and John kicked in the, his mom's belly and they, they were cousins right here. Mm-hmm. Though it does say at verse 80 in, in chapter one of Luke that basically he went off and lived as a solitary, right? Um, mm-hmm. But okay, so we get that. And do you harmonize mm-hmm. that or not? And mm-hmm. the second one of these is when were the first disciples called? And there is a harmonizing version of that. Let me just put that out there. Uh, it's either like, well, we have two different stories from two different traditions in the early church, or maybe these guys met John on the shores of the Jordan River. Mm-hmm. And then later, when they're on the Sea of Galilee, another 45 minutes up north or something mm-hmm. like that, they have already seen him. Mm-hmm. And and so that when Jesus says, follow me, and they get up and go, it's because they already had they already had an introduction. So this wasn't just like, oh my mm-hmm. gosh, mm-hmm. what about what about Zebedee, the, the son, you know, who had these two sons who were working for him mm-hmm. that got up and they left. Mm-hmm. They're like, hey, wait, the nets aren't put away yet, you know. Huh. Um, and so that's a, you know, a kind of harmonizing version about the call. And I just throw that mm-hmm. out to you. What do you think of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you can't overemphasize how the early church really only had an oral tradition to begin with. And the stories were passed around 
these disciples scattered to the various regions of Mesopotamia and beyond, you know, after Jesus died and rose and they had their experience and they were all sent out to their places of mission and the stories went with them. But, you know, Paul's the first one writing and he doesn't mm-hmm. write any of these stories down. He writes about his epiphany on the road and, and how God has, you know, transformed his vision. And um, those are the earliest stories we get, which right. don't even mm-hmm. attempt to harmonize anything in terms of these anecdotes about walking around with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it appears he doesn't even know the stories necessarily of all the disciples and ins and outs of Jesus teaching, but he knows the the practices and he has had his own experience. But when it comes to the gospels, I think the early churches used their stories to form their communities into greater faithfulness and understanding and cohesion and um, learning, discipleship. Sure. And they're told in a way to, with purpose. They're not told mm. as, um, you know, biographies of Jesus or y- even a history of the early church or anything like that. So att- an attempt to harmonize them is just sort of a desecration, if that's too strong a word, but, you know, sort of a desecration of what the intention of them might have been to begin with. Because when we try to harmonize sometimes we lose the the jewel you know nature of each one and and there's one roth author i really would recommend to everybody out there and um whom i love who's alexander shia and i think i've brought him up before but he wrote he wrote a book called the hidden power of the gospels and he talks about how there was he's researched this but that in the early churches there might have been this pattern in liturgy where they used each of the four gospels for different um stages of discipleship which are always concentric and not like just one after the next but you know we're always on the road somewhere we've always experienced some sort of loss and hardship we always have these epiphanies and places of joy and peace then we always have work to do you know and he he posits that each gospel addresses one of those stages you know, mm-hmm. where Mark is like the complete undoing of everything you've ever known. Everything's a stormy sea and a lost place and urgency and finding your grounding, you know, and, and Luke, um, everything's on a road. Everything's kind of the, the, the walk with Jesus. In Matthew, it's the mountaintop and, you know, finding the inner temple and, and um, you know, what do you do with um, great loss and having to rethink everything you've ever known. And then John's this placid garden, you know, like you said, Justin, it's the place of return to Eden, you know, but in a whole new understanding of what that is, it's the inner place. And so, you know, the early churches could have used these gospels in so many ways. And um, so I don't know, I really have grown to appreciate the disharmony in a way that they each serve a purpose and none of them set out to write historical documents. Mm. And they weren't even concerned with accuracy in terms of you know here I mean it was about four o'clock in the afternoon what the heck does that mean why did he even put that in there and what difference does it make what time it was you know but it there must be something to it but I doubt that he's trying to say that this is you know helping historicize the the gospel you know but who knows I think it's both Mm. and kinds of answers but I, I really don't I don't lose a lot of sleep over the way these are not harmonized. Mm -hmm. I think that I like to move into the communities where they came up out of and see how they function maybe and, you know, what pastoral value they had, the way they were written. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that the the Gospels, I don't think the Gospels are historically um, reconcilable. They're just not. Mm-mm. They're just. I mean, they're, they're just not. I mean, we we discussed um, what's maybe the most clear example of that um, a few weeks ago in the um, the dating, which is suggested by Matthew and Luke's mm-hmm. birth narratives. Right, Quirinius was yeah. not around while um, Herod the Great was alive. So they both Luke and Matthew can't be right about mm-hmm. when Jesus was born. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just no way historically to make those two things fit together. The mm-hmm. question is whether or not, as, as you've been, um, as you've been laying out compellingly, uh, the question is whether or not that's devastating to faith or not. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that I would go quite so far as you have, or as I heard you, um, in saying that for none of the gospel writers, um, was giving an historical account, a goal, 
I mean, Luke seems to have that as an explicit goal. Um, now, was he writing a form of history like our form of history? I, mm-hmm. I don't think so. Yeah, he, I would agree with he you. Didn't, he mm-hmm. didn't conceive of himself as, um, uh, you know, writing a writing like a biography of Jesus, like John Meacham wrote a biography of George Washington or something like that. It's not mm-hmm. the same genre, mm-hmm. um, ancient histories, mm-hmm. but I think he does, he is trying to do something more like a history than what John is trying to do. That's mm-hmm. not actually John's goal. Right. John's goal is to give you, to write a book, which in the reading of that book, through the telling of the stories of these signs that are going to structure the first half of the gospel, and then the the glory which is going to be put on display in the second half of the gospel, you, i.e. the reader, will come to know that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. That's how the gospel of John ends. And that's Mm -hmm. a different agenda Mm -hmm. than Luke saying, you know, I'm writing to Theophilus, the lover of God, I'm going to set down an orderly account. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think that the, the authors have different intentions which are worth attending to, and they can be distinct in their own way, and they can have different prisms, different lights that they, that they, um, that they shine on Jesus. Um, I'll say that I think there are many different layers spiritually to Scripture. There's um, what, the, um, what uh, pre-modern theologians would call the literal or the historical reading of Scripture, and that's what we're talking about here. We're at that level. But then there's also an allegorical, there's an mm-hmm. anagogical or a moral, uh, tropological, I think, is the moral one. Anagogical is the eschatological one. It's supposed to talk about the last things. Um, you know, there, there, are, there is a spiritual meaning to Scripture, then there's the historical meaning to Scripture, and the historical meaning to Scripture bears upon the spiritual, but it's not reducible to it, and vice versa is not... The same mm-hmm. thing is true, vice versa. Um, for me, the Scriptures are inspired by God, meaning that in some fashion, these stories were brought into being by God because the, through the... Through the um, the providential ordering of their authorship, their canonization, and so on, which I know is a pretty tall claim, but that's how I understand inspiration anyway. It doesn't mean that these are the words which God told, whispered in the ears of the authors, but it's just to say that in some fashion, the words that we have in Scripture are words that God means for us to wrestle with and to listen for God's voice through. Um, and that's really what makes them the Word of God with a capital W, is that in the reading of these texts and their proclamation and wrestling with them, we encounter Jesus, who is the Word with the capital W. And so that's what I'm always looking for. So it's not to it's not an answer to your question, but it's a kind of I don't really care to your question. Um, Have it your way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and not that I don't. I think it's an interesting question. But to me, the more interesting stuff is what we were talking about in the first half, which is how who is the Jesus who's being put on display mm-hmm. here, and why? Yeah, I, and I okay, okay to both of you. Okay to both of you. <laughs> So we both told you we don't care, uh, yeah. and, and I care incredibly. Next question. Yeah, next question. <laughs> I'm never asking you. I'm never asking you to any more questions. I think where that, are you staying? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what are you looking for, Peter? Rabbi, <laughs> uh, where are you staying? Uh, I think that the I think that the questions of I mean the question there's no doubt that the questions of the historicity of the Gospels cannot be all added up. And mm-hmm. Luke did write an orderly account, but Luke has no idea what the geography is because he's got, right. got mm-hmm. when he's going down the the uh, the Jordan River, he's bouncing all over the place. I mean he's in Bethany. Then he goes back here. And then he says, "We're almost to Bethany." And he's already been there. But mm-hmm. so there's a lot of there's a lot of moving around. I I don't fully. I mean, I get exactly what you were saying, and it's a very sophisticated approach, really, what you're talking about. Um, and uh, which is, we're just gonna we're gonna see these as as um, we're gonna see that we're gonna see the glory in their separateness. I, I think that that for me, there are little there are little things in the Gospels that I just love. I happen to love that it's four o'clock. Uh, I happen to love the pillow in the back that Jesus is asleep on when they're crossing mm-hmm. the sea. I, I, you know, listen, I don't, I'm not into numerology, but that there's 153 fish. I just think it's funny that mm-hmm. there's 153 fish. And I think it points toward, I think it toward, points toward the particularity of reality. Mm-hmm. And so if you were a, if you're an investigator in crimes and people talk in general terms about what happens, I'm reading JK Rowling's, uh, First book to adults, which is Cuckoo Something or Other. I, mm. I've been on this book for about four years. I read one page and fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, but, it came out a little while ago. Uh, yeah, you know, well, uh, she's using a, a pen name. I can't remember the pen name. I can't remember anything about the book, actually, <laughs> even though I'm halfway through it. But what I am getting is there's this guy named Strike who's an investigator. And anytime mm. the description is super general, he gets really like this, something that's not right about this. And so it's in its particularity yeah. that he finds truth. And so mm-hmm. I do think that there is something about the particularity in these things. 
things. And, and, and I think one of the things that I happen to like, uh, and maybe it's just because I've been to the Holy Land a bunch of times, and is that I dig the particularity of imagining the place, seeing these people as real people on the ground in real places, that they are, that it's four o'clock, that, that, that Andrew goes and gets his brother and says, man, we found the dude, man, mm-hmm. Messiah. And, mm-hmm. and that Peter came along <clears throat> and that uh, we have the come and see. And then I, I can't help but pick at, speaking of picking at, so it says that we've got Andrew and another unnamed disciple. And I know some people say it's the beloved disciple, it's John. Mm-hmm. Others say maybe it's <laughs> Philip. And, mm-hmm. and and I don't actually really care, mm-hmm. but I think it's kind of fun that people pick at it. Mm-hmm. And then, and then you know, uh, I think that we see people growing into Christ mm-hmm. and, and the fullness whereof, where it grows fully into them as they yeah. grow fully into him. And, and, and we get these journeys. And so like today we get the, we get my namesake here, Peter. And I, of course I have to dig into that just cause it's my name here. And, and Peter plays a, a you know, a big role in the drama. He's the, mm-hmm. I mean, he's the third most mentioned person in the new Testament besides mm-hmm. Paul and, and Jesus. Mm-hmm. And, and we get this where, where Jesus you know, he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, you're Simon, son of John. So, I mean, here we get again, mm. yeah. like, uh, Jesus is, you know, we, we haven't even touched on the pre-existent Jesus, but now, mm. but his knowledge, and so he's naming mm-hmm. who this is, and so we got, we've got that Simon and Andrew's father is named John, mm-hmm. right? And then mm-hmm. uh, you're going to be called Cephas, which is, tra- <laughs> you know, Cephas being Aramaic, and Peter being, uh, well, Peter being English, and Petros being the Greek, mm-hmm. and, you know, you're going to be the rock. And I, and I, and just to say one other thing here, and then perhaps we need to wrap this up before dinner time. Uh, it's uh, before, not quite four o'clock. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that, that we notice that this is how it starts in the gospel. But when you follow the drama all the way through, mm-hmm. as you're talking in John's gospel, we come all the way to chapter 21. And my favorite scene of the gospel where, where the resurrection scene where they're, you know, Jesus says, come and eat. Mm-hmm. And they, they sit down to eat. And Peter has denied uh, Jesus three times at, at Caiaphas' house out in the courtyard. And he does not call him Peter. He does mm-hmm. not call him Cephas. Peter yeah. was not a rock. He was not a Cephas. He was not a Petros. He says to him, Simon, Simon. son of John. Yeah. So he goes all the way and reboots his rock likeness in chapter mm-hmm. 21. So he goes right down mm-hmm. and he dismantles mm. Peter's self-hatred. Mm. That's what's dismantled yeah. here. It's not that he needs to be put back together with Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, that the, the Jesus needs him. It's that Peter needs to be put back together so that he can then give his life to Jesus. Yeah. And so I think that a lot of what, when we follow the scriptural stories really closely, what we see is Jesus ministering to those who are the very people that are pointing toward him. He's ministering to them. And that he mm-hmm. is the one who puts people together so that they can point toward him. And and so we find here the beginnings of Peter's story, which will be a, which will be a, It'll be a fail story and then a, then a victory story we get. Uh, and we also get John the Baptist, who uh, he's going to fade from us very soon. And, you know, we're not going to get to chapter three where he says, you know, he must increase and I must decrease. And, and John mm-hmm. notes that that's the fullness of his joy. And, and do we see John, do we as, you know, you talked about Andrew as, you know, a, 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 a model of priesthood. Do we see John as a model of all Christian living with a decrease? This is, and as you know, this is a very slippery place for, for people of color who get, it can get wound up in the energy that comes toward them and they don't want to give their place. They, the rector doesn't want to retire because people know his name and then, mm. or her name and then they retire and they, they nobody knows your name um, and, or cares if they did find out your name. So um, I don't know. I mean, there's so much here. <laughs> mm-hmm. I will just say you people in Podville are really good to hang with us because what you can't see is Rob, who's behind the thing, <laughs> is going like this, telling us, <laughs> telling that we're plane. talking too much, <laughs> telling us it is time to cut it off. So we really love Rob. Uh, and so in order to make Rob happy, do we have any last words here? Or do you want to pick up anything I said? Or I mean, we can keep talking. I would just say we have much, much more to say, Rob. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But we totally. won't. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but I will. I can't yeah. resist. Yeah, no, go, resist. For the, go for the, it. Go for it. We've all remarked, um, we've all used the word beautiful in some fashion to describe the story that we've been talking about. And beautiful is a word that, that seems to um, 
uh, it seems to come up a lot whenever we talk about the mm. Gospel of John. Yeah. Uh, but this is this is also this is what we see in John the Baptist here. John the Baptist sees. <coughs> it's a perception. It's a it's it's a per, it's a perception thing. He sees Jesus, and he's captivated by him. He said. Here's the Lamb of God. Mm-hmm. Same thing's going on with mm. with Andrew and the other the other unnamed disciple, right? And the same thing happens to me uh, when I listen to the two of you unfolding the fullness of John's vision of Jesus. Right? I'm captivated by it. Um, and there were moments in my life where I made decisions that were kind of like the one that Andrew made. I mean, I I decided to be a priest. I went. In, I was raised Southern Baptist, as people at home know. I went into an Episcopal church. I was visiting it for the first time with a friend from high school, St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Maryville, Tennessee. I saw the priest, uh, the the Reverend um, Martha, um, oh, I'm forgetting her last name. She's a published author. I'm so sorry, Martha Stern. There we go. The Reverend Martha Stern. I saw um, I saw the Reverend Martha Stern celebrate the Eucharist. I left that church and I said, I'm called to be a priest. That's a cool story. I wasn't even an okay. Episcopalian. How come I, I don't even know a, that story? Well, it's not one that I can tell very often. It's, you don't go into your commission on ministry, the official diocesan committees that do this stuff, and say, oh, I'm not even a ba- I, I'm still a Baptist. I'm not even been confirmed as an Episcopalian <laughs> yet, but I want to be an Episcopal priest. But that's the kind of, this is the way that God sometimes works. Um, <clears throat> mm-hmm. Von Balthasar, one of my favorite theologians, says that the beautiful makes prisoners of those who are freely convinced. And that is what <laughs> the yeah. Bible can do for you, right? Mm, that's, that's what this stuff awesome. does. It's just... Mm-hmm. Bam! Wow! There's the Lamb of God. Yeah. I, I, I the only thing that I wish we might have had time to talk about. So I'll just put a pin in it. Yeah. Is this question Jesus? It's his first words in the Gospel of John. What are you looking for? Oh. And I think that Jesus uh, stages the whole of life with us by meeting us where our deepest desires are, whatever they are, you know, however misguided or however aching or passionate or lonely or whatever they are, what are you seeking? And that's where Jesus wants to start with us. And then, you know, make our desires his desires and bring us forth. And, you know, I think that that's a topic worth another podcast, but I, I do love to just name that that's where Jesus starts and he's not making us come, you know, miles and miles to find him. He's going right out to where our ache, our deepest aches and longings are to, to know what we really desire. And that speaks to, like, the primal human experience of, um, you know, R- R- Ronald Rollheiser calls it the holy longing, you know, that, that like, all-encompassing, aching desire to do more, know more, be more, find love, give love, you know, to experience our fullness. And, you know, like Augustine said, our hearts are restless until we rest in God. And I think that's sort of naming the same thing that that question from Jesus is, you know, really poignant invitation. So, yeah. Well, wow. Worthy yeah. of a whole, I'm really month, glad you said that worthy of, of, uh, and, you know, a, a, a month long retreat. What are you looking mm-hmm. for to unpack that mm-hmm. for each of us? Uh, and you know, what are you looking for and what are you finding and who's doing the finding and, and how much of this is Jesus giving to you? Or is he just saying, come and see, come experience, come live with, mm-hmm. you know, that when you, you started in with where are they staying, which I, in one sense can be taken as the biggest throwaway line in the whole, <laughs> in the whole right. piece here. And mm-hmm. to say, you know, this a quest, this question of abiding with him over time mm-hmm. uh, is a place that unveils what it is that we're seeking, what's our longing. And it helps us to look at that. And I'm remi- reminded of, of you started, in, in a place that remind me of what Fred Beekner had to say, you know, uh, calling is where our deepest longing meets the world's greatest need mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sort of yeah. taking what you're saying yeah. and what you're saying about yeah. your calling as a priest, yeah. that the longing and the, and, and the need and the vocation, the, the vocation being who we are on the inside is what we do on the outside. So your, your, your calling, your vocation lives out the insideness of that relationship, that abiding and 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 it's based in service and your service like john the baptist service and and like andrew's service is to point to the messiah which is what the whole purpose of john's gospel is and where we started the, with the with the with you know lamb of god and with messiah and with the pre-existent one and with the vehicles it's all pointing toward jesus and that's that's kind of the answer to what is your deepest longing somewhere mm-hmm. in there, the answer is Jesus. 
Anyway, um, three and three hours and twenty three minutes later, uh, if you're still here, I hope you treat yourself because it's been a treat for us to be with you. It is uh, for us the second Sunday in Epiphany. Uh, we invite you to come to St. Mark's Episcopal Church in New Canaan, Connecticut. You can get there by going to the website and typing that in and streaming the service. Or else you can you can plug it in and walk in our doors because we'd love to see it because we are a Jesus community of love, grounded in the Scriptures, trying to find our way as people following Jesus. So peace be with you. Thank you to you. Thank you to you. And Rob, thanks for hanging in here while we're still talking. God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye.